Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Nancy Roswell, and I'm President and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Manchester. And it's been my great privilege to work with colleagues from the university and from the Stroke Association in bringing this evening together. When we started talking about this event uh, only six months ago, we thought about what do we want to achieve. Uh, and I was very clear in what I wanted us to try and get out of this event. Fortunately, everybody else agreed with me, um, which was to raise awareness of stroke, a very common and devastating condition which is too rarely spoken about. Secondly, to bring forward the realization that actually you don't have to be very old to have a stroke and you've seen many examples of that. Thirdly, that in fact, even a devastating stroke does not mean the end of a very, very fulfilling life, and you've seen some fantastic stories. And fourthly, that there is extensive research going on that might prove beneficial and of even more hope for the future, and much of that is supported by the Stroke Association. And that's where I come in, because for over 20 years, I've been studying stroke, working with many colleagues who are scientists and clinicians, trying to understand what happens in the brain after a stroke. This is a cartoon of a brain, and what's happened here is a very common stroke caused by a blockage in an artery. It isn't the only sort of stroke that people can get. Sometimes they occur because of bleeding, and sometimes because of damage to small blood vessels. But in all of these, a key feature is the damage that follows because of reduced oxygen to parts of the brain. We now know a lot about what happens in the brain after a stroke. And one of the important things we know is that damage doesn't occur instantaneously. There are some parts of the brain that are damaged quite quickly, but other surrounding areas around here that actually may not be damaged for hours or, in some cases, even days. We know that those parts of the brain have got just about enough oxygen to survive. They're teetering on the balance between life and death. So the critical thing is to find out what causes them to live or die, and then to try to find ways to stop those factors that cause them to die. One of the things we know is that, in fact, like many, many diseases, it's the products of our own processes that actually cause the damage. Almost all diseases that aren't due to infectious agents or an injury are because there's something in our own bodies, something very useful, beneficial, that actually can cause damage if it's activated too much, if it's produced in the wrong place or in the wrong time. And that's true also in a stroke. We know, for example, we all have chemicals in our brains that are essential for normal function. These small chemicals are released in tiny amounts from the end of nerve endings, and they send signals to other cells that let us think, remember, speak. But some of those chemicals are highly toxic. And when they're released, it's in tiny amounts, and then they're very quickly su sucked back up again to prevent damage. But we've all got enough of those chemicals to potentially cause havoc. And one of the things that happens in damage to the brain, in a stroke, in a hemorrhage, in an injury, is that too much of those chemicals are released in an uncontrolled way. So we've been trying for many years to block the release or the effects of those chemicals in order to reduce the amount of damage. That's proven very, very difficult. And the reason is because of something I just told you, because those chemicals are essential for our brains to function normally. So trying to stop the damaging bit and leave the part that we actually need to function has proven incredibly difficult. So what we've done is something slightly different. And we've said, so never mind the chemicals we need for normal function, the molecules that help our brains function in everyday life. Are there any that we only see in diseases? Are there processes that don't happen in healthy bodies, in healthy tissues, in healthy cells? And there's one key process doesn't happen in healthy tissues or healthy people, but it does happen in disease. And that is something called inflammation. You'll all have experienced inflammation. If you've cut yourself and it's got infected, if you've had an ingrowing toenail, if you have rheumatism or bowel disease, and indeed, if you've had a stroke. So inflammation is one of the best body defenses to infection. 
When you get an infection, whether it's a flu or, or a mild infection, perhaps in your finger or your knee, then our own bodies produce an array of defense systems. The swelling and the redness and the pain, cells move in to try and cause repair, to try and remove the infectious agent. These are all our own defense mechanisms. But again, when they're overactivated or in the wrong place or in the, at the wrong time or for too long, inflammation causes many diseases. We've known about arthritis for a long time. We know asthma is caused by inflammation. We've known about inflammatory bowel syndrome. We now also know that inflammation is important in diabetes, in cancer, and in brain diseases. So some of the things that we have found is that inflammation is switched on in the brain after a stroke. And our brains produce inflammatory molecules. It's probably tricked into thinking, we need our defense systems to be activated here, so let's produce these inflammatory molecules. But actually, they cause damage. And we found one particular molecule. It's called IL-1. And it's produced by cells in the brain after a stroke. And it's also produced by white cells in our blood. And those white cells often travel to the area of damage, trying to help, of course, but actually produce this IL-1, which causes damage. You all have experienced IL-1 because one of its key features is it causes a fever. That's the molecule that causes a fever when you have flu. It's the same molecule that causes you to lose your appetite, to feel lethargic, and to get depressed. Many of the symptoms actually of a stroke. So it's a good thing when in small amounts. It's a very bad thing when it's produced in the brain after a stroke. And one of the things we know is that in an infection, there is more IL-1 produced. Many of you will be aware that infection can make a stroke worse. And certainly, infection can make many other brain diseases worse. So sufferers of multiple sclerosis and of Alzheimer's, infections often tend to accelerate the symptoms. So IL-1 is bad news. But there is some possible hope. There is, in fact, a naturally occurring blocker of IL-1. It's something we all produce in our bodies to halt the actions of IL-1 when it's getting out of control. Its scientific name is IL-1-RA, but actually it's also been produced as a drug, and it's called anakinra. And anakinra has been used to treat rheumatism. So because we knew IL-1 was produced in the brain after a stroke, we wondered whether or not anakinra could be a help. Experimental studies suggest it could be. So a few years ago, we did a small study on stroke patients. We were really just seeing if it looked as though it was going to be safe, and it could be potentially used in larger studies. The study was undertaken at Hope Hospital, where we do most of our clinical research. The study was quite successful, though it was very small. It looked as though those patients who'd had the anakinra rather than the placebo were doing a bit better, and certainly the other inflammatory markers that you see in the blood, they were damped down. We then did some other studies, and we found that anakinra, even though it's quite big, can get into the brain. So that was another step forwards. So now we've just completed a larger study in a group of patients with hemorrhage. Half of them have got placebo, half of them have had anakinra. I don't know the results yet because they haven't been uh, identified. It's all blinded. So we'll wait to see if that larger study is of benefit. We've just started enrolling into a larger stroke study at Hope Hospital, again, where half the patients have anakinra and half of them have placebo. Again, we won't know the answer for some time. That study is fully funded by the Stroke Association. But if it does show some benefit, and interestingly, anakinra seems to have just about no side effects, then we'll be able to go on to a big study that may provide some real hope for stroke. Now, anakinra would have to be given within six hours after a stroke, we think, because that's when the damage is occurring. But now what we're starting to do is to look at, can inflammation somehow affect the way our brains repair and recover? Some of the remarkable presenters we've heard here have made incredible recoveries. But could we accelerate that recovery? Could we modify the same sort of pathways, and instead of giving it within six hours of a stroke, give it six months or a year or two years after and still promote recovery. And another approach that we're looking at is to use stem cells that uh, studies in, in Glasgow are ongoing at the moment to look at whether or not stem cells could provide a hope 
for the future. I never like to make false promises. We never know the answer to research. If we did, we wouldn't be doing it. But there is a possibility, I think, that within the next few years, there will be radical new treatments for stroke and related disorders, both to give soon after the stroke and to give somewhat later. But I'm going to finish in a second and, and, and close the session, but I do want to comment on something else, which is the title of this evening, Sound Stroke Art. We agonised over that title for many, many hours. But what we wanted to do was bring together something about the treatments for strokes, something about the science behind it, together with art, and demonstrate that the two are actually closely interlinked. I have to say, I've had a lifelong passion that science and art are really not very different at all. In fact, I'll confess that I nearly became an artist instead of a scientist. Probably wouldn't have made any money, so that was a good choice for me. But I completely agree with one of the comments that Mike made, that communication is so incredibly important. Communication is important in everyday life and for stroke sufferers. And different means of communication, whether it's through poetry or through art or through music or verbally, is incredibly important. And as I try to tell, often unsuccessfully, my scientific colleagues, it's also extremely important in science. And so I think it's fantastic that we've had an event bringing together scientists, clinicians, stroke sufferers, stroke survivors, those who support the Stroke Association, artists of many different types who've come here together this evening. And so I want to finish by saying a big thank you to the people who have participated in this event. Both those who've presented, thank you so much. It's been inspirational to me. It's been really uh, quite, it's brought home to me what I study on, what I study all the time, and, and brings me to think we must work harder to try and get better treatments. Thank you to the audience for coming. Um, thank you to my many colleagues at the university and thank you also to the Stroke Association. But I'm going to embarrass one individual by saying without this one individual, this would never have happened. And I want Chris Larkin to stand up. Everybody will continue to try to find new treatments uh, for to, to either prevent or treat stroke. And it's fantastic what the people here are doing. And we are all very grateful and very inspired by this evening. Thank you. Thank you.